I'm very honored to have been asked to be here this afternoon. My name is Christine Lynch. I'm chair of the Collections uh, Committee of the Wolfville Historical Society. And this is Crystal Tanner, who was working with us at the time of this move, and who will, now that she's completed her certificate from Fleming College, be our curator at Randall House this coming season. But I really shouldn't be here talking to you today. Jan Baldwin should be here talking to you today because she is a member of our organization and a volunteer, and she really orchestrated this move, uh, but she couldn't be here today. Um, I guess that's fine. Yeah. A little bit of background. The Society was founded in 1941. It's a registered and incorporated charity and acts in public trust to preserve and share through interpretation a collection of over 5,000 artifacts, photographs, and archival material that relate to the history of Wolfville and surrounding communities in Kings County. The picture here shows the new coat of paint on Randall House. It didn't look quite so nice last year. In 1947, the Society acquired Randall House a registered heritage property which is remarkably unchanged despite having been a private residence for nearly 150 years. And the Society operates Randall House as Wolfville's community museum and in 1973 became its sole owner. We're a member of the Association of Nova Scotia Museums. The Society is run largely by volunteers. We have a paid curator only for the summer season when we're open and we try to get grants for student help to run the museum in the summer. This presents great challenges in doing as much as we'd like to do, but we have a lot to be proud of and a great collection, and we're very fortunate in the skills of our volunteers. Since it first opened its doors in May 1949, the Randall House Museum has been the depository for a substantial collection of artifacts accumulated mostly through donation. Many of these items fall under the category of textiles and personal artifacts that presently totals approximately 600 articles. We have a few slides here to give you an idea of the type of material we had to move and rehouse in the museum. Hats, uniforms and men's clothing, boots and shoes. I'd like to point out one of my favorites is this child's sandal, which was found in the wall of a house in Grand Pre, and it's what's called a concealment shoe. Uh, uh, apotropaic is the word that describes an object that's put in the wall to, or put somewhere to ward off evil or bad luck. There's a registry of such concealment shoes in England, actually. <clears throat> we have purses and accessories and household textiles including quilts, coverlets, wool blankets, table coverings, furniture and shelf lakes, lace, and other things such as doll clothes. This item here, the cruel work pocket, is, is one of the oldest textiles we think in our collection. In a way, this is a story of two moves and two organizations because for many years the collection, the textile collection, was stored in Randall House on hanging racks in the attic, in trunks, which were themselves artifacts, in dresser drawers, closets, and in sorted boxes. But in 2007, the collection was moved from the museum to a room off site on the recommendation of the curator of the time, Bonnie Elliott, who was. Uh, had a lot of experience in costume management. And the collection committee at the time um, had a, presented a report to the board and an assessment is made at the collection of the, of the time and what was needed to be done. So this is the building three blocks away from the museum where the collection was stored in a basement room on the, on the, on the right hand picture at the very end where the yellow door is. It was a room just on the bottom there, basement basement. Um, this is a 
in that time, between 2007 and 2014, 2014, uh, a lot of improvements were made. And I'm going to let Crystal take over now, and she can describe some of the organization of the room as it was then. So these pictures show uh, the basement room where the collection was being stored. Um, it measures about 22 by 24 feet. Um, there are four basement windows in the space that we covered with a dark fabric um, to eliminate any light from getting in. Uh, the flooring is carpet over concrete. Uh, there's a, several other features in the space, including a kitchen sink in one corner with wooden kitchen cupboards above the sink. We had one entrance door and there, were, uh, there was forced air heating from above. Um, we had no climate control, so we kind of had to create our own by using a dehumidifier during the summer months and then using the forced air heating in the winter. Uh, to store our collection, we used four six-foot long rolling hanging racks and a smaller hanging rack that wasn't movable. The metal shelving that we used and still do was donated, some with metal shelves, some with wooden shelves. Uh, storage boxes were cardboard from a dress shop as well as file boxes from Staples. Although some, uh, only some of the boxes were acid-free, um, we tried and still try to do our very best to protect our artifacts by wrapping them in acid-free tissue paper um, within the boxes. Uh, we had a rack uh, designed and constructed by one of our society volunteers um, who is an engineer. Uh, the quilt rack was made out of wood and was painted um, and this is what we used to, uh, to store our rolled part of the collection which at the time included around 30 quilts, flags, blankets, and coverlets. Um, these were stored as per CCI guidelines on cardboard tubes, rolled on the racks, and covered with muslin covers. Uh, the cardboard tubes that we used were obtained from a printing company and were originally used for rolled paper. Um, we also had two eight-foot-long folding tables that you can sort of see right there. Uh, that's what we used for our workspace. We also had a metal filing cabinet in the area to hold our files. And during um, the time that the collection was in this space, we, uh, we described, if not fully cataloged, most of the collection. Um, however, many had no accession numbers, so we're still working on that. Uh, we did a lot of necessary conservation measure or treatments. Um, we rolled the quilts and hung them on the rack. Uh, we put items on padded hangers um, that we created ourselves, and we properly stored artifacts in acid-free tissue in boxes, um, acid-free where we could. Um, but there was still a lot to do, especially on the digitization side of things, uh, which was compounded by the lack of internet in the space. Uh, then we come to the years 2013-2014, uh, when the collection was in simple terms evicted. Uh, the building which had belonged to the Anglican Church in Wolfville uh, was sold to the Larsh Home Fires community, which was starting to renovate the building. Uh, we were given notice of the renovations and were given several months to find a new space, uh, but we weren't able to find an appropriate one in town. Um, in the meantime, access to the building was made extremely difficult. Uh, we had to go get a key every time we wanted to go in the building, and we were only allowed in um, during specific times of the day. So the collection really wasn't accessed as often for work um, or for monitoring. Um, we also believe at the time the building changed hands, the heating changed, uh, which uh, with decreased access may have caused our second major problem, uh, mold fun, uh, we decided that ultimately we had to move the collection back to the museum. So my turn again. So a uh, moving plan was prepared and preparations went ahead. We got the approval of the board for the move back to the museum. Uh, members were not very happy about it because of course it would mean less display space. But it was an urgent matter. Uh, a budget had been determined by uh, our our collection committee and the Randall House Management Committee, and that was approved by the board. The weight of the collection was determined. There was a structural analysis of the new space, which is an upper room in the, in the museum. Equipment was bought and constructed, and or constructed. The room was cleaned, windows darkened, and a conservatory arranged. 
and a light moved from the north wall to the south wall. The termination of weight was an interesting process. <laughs> uh, the scale that we used was a Salter brand home scale determined to be accurate. The quilts, we took representative quilt rolls, and weighed them and multiplied by the number of rolls. The quilt rack weight was determined based on the weight of its constituent components. We have an engineer who's <laughs> helpful in this. <laughs> Steel <laughs> hanging racks. Each end was weighed and the results were added together. The boxes were weighed. We had to consider additional shelving that we were going to purchase. And the weight of two persons working in the room was also included. So, <laughs> a total of 1,146 pounds was determined. Not bad. <laughs> so this weight was given to our engineer. Not, not the engineer who's on staff, but, or on, who's a member, but another one. Randall House is at least 200 years old. At the time of construction, there was no such thing as a national building code. And uh, since the floor in the northwest bedroom was experienced as bouncy, <laughs> it was considered that a structural appraisal of the floor strength would be prudent. The committee recommended that a structural engineer be retained to inspect and report. The board approved this, uh, and the expense recommended by the committee was approved also. So Larry Honey, professional engineer, was engaged by the committee, and arrangements were made. Before his visits to Randall, visit to Randall House, the committee estimated the weight of the clothing, as I just mentioned, and gave this information to Mr. Honey. And also before his visit, part of one floor plank in the room was lifted. The planks were seen to be underlain by a subfloor, which was unexpected. Nevertheless, three floor joists could be seen. Their dimensions were established as well as their spacing. Sufficient evidence of nail heads beneath a multitude of coats of floor paint were found and showed a uniform spacing of joists across the room. Mr. Honey emphasized that it is necessary to avoid the center of the room when placing loads. Limit the number of people working in the room to three if practicable. There isn't really room for three to work there. <laughs> and be aware that floor movement bounce is unavoidable and that cracks in the plaster of the ceiling in the room below were likely to appear over time. Well, they haven't yet. Since the room is about 15 by 16 or 240 square feet, one of the rooms is, the net deck weight load is only five pounds per square foot. So, Mr. Honey concluded in his report, in my opinion, the existing floor is structurally safe for the intended use. Great relief to everybody. <laughs> All right, so then we're going to go back to the mold problem. Uh, so, we set about helping to conserve the parts of our collection that had been impacted by mold. Uh, we contacted local conservator Kelly Barassa. Um, he has a diploma in the conservation of historical objects from the University of Lincoln in England, and he is a lifesaver. Um, we had an initial assessment done in early January, uh, where Kelly visited the space with uh, Jan and myself. And we went through the collection as thoroughly as possible, box by box. Uh, clothing rack by clothing rack, um, to look for other artifacts that might have possessed mold, and oh boy, didn't we find any. It was a couple of weeks later in mid-January of 2014 when those items received proper conservation treatment. So in total, we had about 20 items that needed some level of conservation. Um, in all cases, the textiles were hand wiped with Orvis soap, which is, as we all know, museum grade pure concentrated soap. Um, it was in distilled water and hand wiped in distilled water using a separate sponge for each. Uh, the textiles were dried by hanging in a rack in the textile storage space. Um, gloves and masks were used when mold was, well, was present. Um, all work done was, or all the work that was done was in a separate space from the textile storage uh, with windows open for fresh air at either end of the room. Uh, the mold was on the exterior surfaces in all cases. Um, this surface mold was treated. Um, careful examination determined that no interior contamination occurred. Uh, we took photographs for each artifact that was affected. And several items that, uh, when we were going through them, we identified them as being appropriate for dry cleaning. Um, so we removed the insignia and buttons and headed on down to the local dry cleaners. Uh, so unfortunately, we couldn't save everything. We tried, but we failed. 
Um, so a few artifacts did succumb to the mold. Um, upon assessment, those items that were considered lost were isolated for deaccession and eventual discard. Um, so as you can see, this once very lovely pair of gloves is one example of an artifact that we deemed unable to save. They were originally actually stored with a belt that we did save. Uh, we conserved and cleaned up the mold on it. Um, so the gloves, among the other several items, were quarantined uh, from the rest of the collection so that no further infection uh, spread. So now we get to the actual move itself, which took place over several days uh, due to volunteer schedule constraints and limitations on access to the storage location. We were also very constrained by weather patterns and could only work on the good weather days, which as we know in Nova Scotia, it's a little bipolar. It was April, though, it was not yeah. Uh, so throughout the moving, the entire moving process, we had about a total of three cars and four volunteers helping at various times throughout the, the move. So this is the new space that we moved into. This is inside Randall House. I don't have a floor plan. I'm really sorry about yeah. that. I should have included a floor plan. Um, so the new space is in on the second floor of the museum. It's the northwest bedroom which measures, as Christine said, 15 feet by 16 feet. And um, then we see, like, in the second picture over there, uh, the smaller of the rooms that we also took over for our collection. Um, and that measures roughly about six feet by 10 feet. So it took up basically half of our display space. Well, all, almost all of yeah. our upstairs storage space because there were, we've already taken two bedrooms, one for an office and one for our other storage room for other artifacts. Right? And so this took up another one. So that leaves yeah. only one bedroom upstairs as display. But it's awesome. So it's worth yeah. a visit. So the first room, or textile storage room one, because that's fancy, is the much bigger of the two. Um, that's where we relocated our quilt racks, clothing racks, some shelving units, and a table for workspace. Uh, we had to ax one of the work tables because we didn't have enough room. Um, we also placed, uh, we had another quilt rack made and we placed one against the north wall while the, while the second smaller quilt rack was placed at a 90 degree angle to it, forming a separator in the room. Um, when we were placing things in the space, we didn't really have a choice in the matter uh, because we were trying to follow Mr. Honey's recommendations in his report, so we didn't fall through the floor. So also in room one, we placed the work table on the south wall against the fireplace. Not to worry though, the fireplace hasn't been used in years. Um, we also had the light source moved from the north wall to the south wall to provide better light over our workspace uh, to help protect the artifacts in this space. As you can see from the middle picture, we placed uh, the black fabric over the windows to help eliminate the natural light from getting in. Uh, next slide. Um, in the second and smaller room, we placed the remaining metal shelving units um, and quite a few boxes that we still have to rehouse. Um, some of which are still not acid-free, although over time we have constructed our own acid-free boxes. Um, and it's something that we're going to definitely continue to do moving forward. Uh, so another part of the project was all about location, location, location. Uh, we adopted a new labeling system at the museum in which we labeled all of the racks, shelves, and boxes, um, really to facilitate easier access to the collection. Um, we also decided to continue the sequence of shelf numbers from our other storage room, uh, just for consistency's sake. Um, and if we could all just close our eyes for a moment and imagine a utopian universe where we have one giant room full of our collection, well, that's what we want at Randall House. Um, so if this were to ever happen in the future, fingers crossed, the consistency we created now will really benefit us in that we won't have to waste the time to create a new location. System, I should say. Okay, this is my part again. My background's in library science, so. Um, You're doing okay. <laughs> You're getting it. So uh, part of my interest has been over the years at the museum is, is uh, getting the, the uh, locations of the objects um, entered into our database, which is a collective access database. So for the textile move, of course, this meant a restatement of where things were located. And we started with the higher, highest level of description, with, which is what's in room one and what's in room two. So we started there. 
You see we have a screenshot of the, this item, which is a coverlet, bone blanket, and it's in textile room one. And we can assume that it's on one of the quilt racks, but it hasn't been designated which quilt rack it is on yet. No. Then we started, but we have started to add a next level of description for some items. In this case, we have here shelf I, I what is that? <laughs> I one. box three yeah. and box yeah. three. So these items we now know where they are. They're in textile room two, shelf I one, box three. Here's another example. This uh, uniform shirt is in textile room one on hanging rack one. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Close enough. And hard to see. So we continue to uh, enrich our uh, documents by photography. And so at least it may be stored in this room, but at least some of these items can be accessed digitally online through Nova Muse. And here's one example. This is a handmade wedding vest worn by uh, Otis Eaton for his wedding in 1835. It's a little bit hard to see here. So, budget. We had a budget approved of about $1,500. The engineering consult was $200. We had four new shelf units at $129 each. Quilt rack rebuilt. This was rebuilt by our volunteer for minimal cost, $50. Conservation consult and conservation, $306. Dry cleaning, $40. Electrician for moving the light from the north wall to the south wall, $85. Cleaning and window material, no cost in house. And labor and transportation, <sighs> donated. <laughs> Total, $1,197. So we came in. <laughs> so going forward. There's some disadvantages and some advantages. Disadvantages, we have less space than before. <laughs> and less workspace than before. And we have lost two more display rooms at the museum. And the environment is not ideal, but then the environment at the previous place was also not ideal. So looking at the positives, we save $100 per month. That helps. And this is the best thing, I think, is that access is so much more improved because the collection is on site. We can do photography, we can do research, we can reorganize, we can relabel, we can conserve, and we can monitor the environment. We have internet access so that if we have an item we want to enter to the database, it's right there. Uh, and so it, it, that's it, it's a huge improvement, really. So we have to take that as a consolation to the last space. And our storage has become an exhibit in itself. I, when people do visit the museum, it's a way of showing what goes on behind the scenes. And people are interested in that. And when you are able to talk about it, I think it's, it's very beneficial for people who visit the museum to know about that. So it's very obvious when they come upstairs, there's one display room bedroom and the rest is workspace, office, storage. Still awesome, worth a visit. So what next? Well, we consider, continue to reorganize because we haven't fin completely finished all our labeling. We haven't uh, finished putting things in acid-free boxes. Uh, we may have to go through and conserve more things. We want to do more photography so that we can share at least online, give access to this material that's stored in this room, <laughs> a very crowded way. And we search for new space still. And can we build an annex? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Question mark. We'd love to have an annex. Uh, I was just going to go back one. Oh, sorry. Oh, crap. I mean, oops. Yeah, and the other thing, which is quite big actually, is that we're going to have to deaccession more items because it's the only way we're going to be able to have more space. We have new, new things coming in, and we just don't have space to put them. If we don't go through ruthlessly, I, I would have to say, through our collection and deaccession some things that 
don't have proven provenance, maybe don't fit our mandate, maybe aren't in the best condition, maybe are replicates of things we already have, maybe we can give them away somewhere else. We're going to have to do uh, a big job pruning our collection because that's the only way in the short term we're going to have any more space. Now so, I can go? Now you can go. Okay. <laughs> So I just want to thank, uh, thank you for letting us share our situation and our experience at Randall House. Uh, it's been quite a challenge. Yes. And thank you, Crystal, yeah, you're for welcome. helping. You're welcome.